And Tim, welcome. Hello. How are you doing? I'm good. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Will. Yeah. Good morning for you. Good afternoon for us. I know you're in California, so it's very early for you. And thank you for getting up so early for us. Thank you very much. Um, let me introduce you very, very, very shortly. Um, so Tim Dawkins is uh, uh, leads a portfolio of automotive and autonomous mobility policy research activities for the World Economic Forum. And he, he, did, um, he is studying the future governance needs uh, and of automotive, uh, automotive, automated sorry, vehicles. Tim holds an MBA of the Surrey Business School, so that was very important to mention here. And uh, today, Tim will um, explain what autonomous mobility is, because I think it's not always um, obvious for us what it really implies, whether it is a disruptive force in the automobile industry, uh, and what kind of consequences are there for different types of stakeholders. And if there is a need, for instance, also for uh, ecosystem management to accelerate adoption. Um, Tim, um, we have been. We, I, I heard you a, a few months ago on another um, on another uh, webinar. That was a fascinating um, presentation. So now we're going to focus a little bit more on the ecosystem. In in the mobility, is the you, you have a monopoly here because it's the only webinar uh, part or only webinar that we're going to focus on mobility. We we usually focus on healthcare, on on agriculture, and energy. But you are the only one on mobility, and I'm happy that you accepted that because I think it's a beautiful, it's a, it's a very interesting application field. Uh, I will not take too much, uh, too more. Uh, I will not take more time, so I'll leave the floor to you. Go ahead, please. Thanks very much, Wim. Um, hopefully, everyone can see these. Uh, oh, yeah. I need to hit resume there. Um, hopefully, you can see these slides. Um, so yes, good morning or good afternoon to you guys. I suppose mostly. Um, so. As Wim said, uh, yes, I am responsible for a portfolio of autonomous vehicle research projects at the World Economic Forum. Um, and in my past lives, I've worked as a consultant doing uh, research and development of um, automated driving technologies, driver assistance, and vehicle security systems. And I also spent a brief stint in the British Army as well. Um, I have an MBA from Surrey Business School. I also have a bachelor's degree in motorsport engineering and um, hold a few other further certifications which I shan't go into right now, but um, if you want to know more about me, then do go ahead and look me up on LinkedIn. So today I'm here to talk to you about autonomous vehicles. And given Wim's uh, particular passion for digital transformation, I wanted to really put the lens on how the introduction of automated driving is really turning the automotive industry on its head and how that industry transformation is coming in the form of a value chain shift. So, Today, I'm going to give you a very quick introduction into the World Economic Forum for those of you who are less familiar with, um, with our organization and what we do. Um, and then we're going to talk about, at a high level, um, how autonomous vehicles work, um, how AI fits into that, and how they use data to understand their environment. And then we'll uh, turn our attention to the business model and how um, that value chain shift is, is driving industry transformation as a result of automating the vehicle. Um, for those of you that can see my video, my cat has also joined us for this presentation, so that's what those uh, ears are on my chest. Anyway, on to the uh, quick introduction here to the World Economic Forum. So many of you will know the World Economic Forum for our events, such as our annual meeting in Davos, um, but we are much more than just a convening organisation. So we are, we call ourselves the International Organisation for Public-Private Cooperation, and this means that Broadly, we help industry and, and government understand each other better and um, tackle problems within their specific industries or focus areas to improve the state of the world. Um, we do this through a model that we call uh, multi-stakeholder engagement. And that really means making sure that not only um, all businesses and all uh, global leaders, but also civil society and the voice of the public are also represented in the conversations and, and the, um, the sessions and the projects that we run. Um, we've been doing this for over 50 years and we engage with our partners, that is to say industries, governments um, and the folks that we work with across pretty much all industries and sectors. Now, I am part of our platform for shaping the future of mobility, um, but we do this in everything from artificial intelligence to cybersecurity, um, public goods, uh, energy, manufacturing, health. Um, we have teams that focus on all of these things. 
Now, as Wim said, I'm based out of our team in San Francisco. Um, we have a team out here that focuses on technology policy and technology governance. Um, so I have peers that work on things like blockchain, um, facial recognition and uh, develop policy research and run portfolios of activities along those lines as well. So as I said, I'm part of our platform for shaping the future of mobility. We have four focus industries um, and a team working in each. So I'm part of our automotive and autonomous mobility team. Um, we have an aerospace and drones team that think about the future of the skies and, and how we uh, manage unmanned vehicles. We have an aviation travel and tourism team that looks after the kind of conver conventional air aerospace industry. And then a supply chain and transportation team that focuses on the movement of goods by whatever means. Now, across those teams, we all have a common mission, uh, and that is to make sure that the future of mobility is safe, clean and inclusive. And as you can imagine, most of my work in autonomous vehicles is focused on the safe piece right now. So how do we define a safe autonomous vehicle, for example? But also, um, you know, increasingly it is it is expanding into the sustainability piece. So how do we understand the, the, uh, the impact in uh, of introducing autonomous mobility on decarbonisation of the mobility ecosystem? And how can autonomous vehicles make mobility more inclusive? How can we use them to offer services in mobility deserts, for example? So that's kind of the scope of the work that we do. Now, within uh, my personal portfolio of work, um, as Wim said, this is largely focused on autonomous vehicle governance. So thinking about the future regulatory environments that we're going to need um, for the autonomous future that we are promised to be a reality. And so this means bringing together communities of autonomous vehicle companies, tech developers, suppliers, car manufacturers, um, as well as regulators, research labs, test beds, um, and uh, universities to come together and identify the needs, the gaps that we want to address and develop these tools and frameworks that, uh, that we believe can um, help further the development of regulations and standards that are needed to govern the future automotive sector. So here are some examples. Um, each of these is a clickable link. So when Wim distributes the slides, um, you can, if you want to know more about our research, you can click one of these and find the white papers and, and content all there. So that's the quick introduction to the slide. Let's get into the meat of today's conversation. So I'm going to start with a very quick introduction to autonomous vehicles and how they work. Um, hopefully by the time uh, you all leave here today, you'll all be experts like me and you'll, you'll be able to identify a self-driving car and um, explain it to your parents or children as appropriate. So firstly, let's start with the question, how do you make a vehicle drive itself? So an autonomous vehicle or an automated vehicle um, is a vehicle that has been fitted with sensors, hardware and software with an aim of automating the act of driving, um, the, the driving task, sorry. Now, this development has been um, enabled by a range of technology developments across multiple domains, whether that's AI, software, the sensors themselves, semiconductors, manufacturing, in-vehicle networking. All of this has all of these improvements over decades and decades have um, yielded the, uh, the ability for us to package all these sensors into a car today. Now, an autonomous vehicle can be based upon bring those up there. Uh, can be based upon um, an existing conventional car, van or truck with sensors that are retrofitted to it. Some of you will have seen some prototypes that have hardware kind of bolted to the roof like that. Um, or they could be a, a purpose-built vehicle that's designed specifically for autonomous driving and doesn't have a steering wheel or pedals. Now, whether it's a purpose-built or an upfitted vehicle, um, an autonomous vehicle will have a suite of sensors that are intended to localize the vehicle and monitor its environment and other road users. Now, the type and configuration of those sensors will depend on the vehicle's intended use, where it's intended to operate, some of the design choices by the developer, um, and a number of other functions such as packaging and cost. The developer will also develop a control system, which comprises both hardware and software to uh, integrate all that data and drive the vehicle itself. And together, that hardware and software stack um, that is installed on the vehicle is referred to as an automated driving system or ADS. Now, the task of driving um, for an autonomous vehicle is actually very similar to how you or I might drive a car. Um, and we this takes three steps, which we call in the industry, sense, plan and act. So firstly, the autonomous vehicle software uh, takes inputs from the various sensors to build a three-dimensional model of the vehicle's environment. 
um, it fuses this data together in a process called sensor fusion, um, combining, say, radar data with camera data to give you object detection, classification, and ranging, um, and then builds a 3D model of the, the environment with the things and the roadway around the vehicle. The next step is to plan. So we'll take a look at the movement of other things around, around it and the free space that the vehicle has and determine how does it best execute a route based upon where it needs to go and the free space that's available around the vehicle. Then with that path deduced, um, the control system will step in and uh, execute the required path by controlling the steering, acceleration and brakes. Now, each of these steps uh, are, are rather complex in their own development rights and require a very different set of engineering skills to execute. And each of them can be powered by AI. Um, so it's a very uh, involved process in terms of doing this full stack development and one that has cost startups and automakers alike a huge amount of money in terms of software development and, and time. Now, within the industry, um, you will hear uh, people refer to levels of automation. Hopefully some of you might have come across them before, but I'll just quickly run through them here to give you a little guide. Now, these are the SAE levels. They were defined by the Society of Automotive Engineers a few years ago in something called J3016. Um, and essentially they dictate what the driver and the human does. Now, uh, many vehicles on sale today, whether that's a Tesla or a high-end Mercedes, Audi, even a Golf these days, um, come with what we call level two partially automated driving systems. And these are systems which offer two simultaneous axes of control of the vehicle. So they may control the acceleration and braking and the steering side to side um, simultaneously. Um, however, in these systems, the driver is fully responsible for engaging them and monitoring them at all times. Where things get a little tricky is when we move beyond that point. So at level three, the driver is still responsible for engaging the system, but when the system is engaged, um, the driver can sit back and check their emails, watch Netflix and engage or otherwise engage in a secondary task. Um, now these systems are called conditional automation because they are only intended to be engaged in certain conditions or driving environments. And the driver is responsible for uh, stepping in if something goes wrong. Now, this is um, a very tricky thing to engineer for, not just in terms of um, creating a smooth handover process, but also that re-engagement, those human factors are very difficult uh, to actually coach a, a, an untrained driver. Well, I say an untrained driver, coach an average driver, I would say, into doing the right thing. So not only engaging it at the right time, but also making the correct intervention when the intervention is needed. At level four, um, we no longer require the driver uh, to actually do anything with the vehicle. So a level four vehicle is designed to operate without driver intervention within a constrained environment. So this may be Perhaps if you could imagine a, um, a simple shuttle that operates on a university campus, say, or the example here of a highway chauffeur feature is a system that doesn't require the driver fallback to be a fallback mode. Um, and then at level five, SE level five is essentially the all singing, all dancing, uh, omnipotent, goes anywhere, can function in any conditions, um, autonomous vehicle, will potentially could never need a human in it and doesn't really have any operational constraints. So for the purposes of today's discussion, when I say autonomous vehicle, I'm mostly going to mean a level four or level five vehicle, um, but there will be a couple of good examples where I'll say specifically level three as well. Um, so that's just a little background on uh, how we talk about these technologies um, within the automotive industry. Now, over to business side of the house. So automation of the driving task is actually quite an old idea. Um, car manufacturers have been doing this since the introduction of the very first uh, radar cruise control systems. Um, in the late 1990s. And since then, um, they have developed a range of what we call advanced driver assistance systems that have taken little pieces of the driving task, whether that's switching your headlights on and off or um, emergency braking systems, and slowly introduced them into, uh, into you know, trickling down from, from the luxury vehicles to the mainstream cars and offering more and more of these automated features to, in conventional passenger vehicles. And this is very much business as usual for car makers. They're able to add more value and sell you a more expensive car with more optional extras by adding these sensors and these little features. But these are kind of discrete features. Even in the case of Tesla Autopilot, it's an add-on function 
that actually combines an, a, an, an adaptive cruise control and a lane centering system. Where we see a shift um, is when we start to think about um, autonomous mobility. So as I said, these advanced driver assistance systems are essentially taking a car that you or I own and park on a driveway and insure and you know, bear all that financial cost with and adding a layer of sensors and features that perhaps might give us a car that can do some of the driving itself and has this safety bubble to make it very difficult to crash in the form of all of these features. This paradigm shift, this disruptive innovation, however, comes by taking the driver out of the equation. Um, and this is where the idea of digital transformation comes in, at least as far as uh, womenized conversations um, would, would lead me to believe. Um, let's take a look at what this means in terms of paradigm shifts. Um, so there are many digital transformations going on in the automotive industry right now. If we think about the conventional automotive industry as it, is, as it, as it has existed for 100 plus years, um, it's been very product oriented. The customer is sold a vehicle which you use to meet your mobility needs, um, drive your family and friends around. Um, the market forces are kind of driven conventionally uh, that you know, dictate the operations of, of the uh, car manufacturers. They have to invest in their own R&D. Um, and you know, back when I got my engineering degree, mechanical engineering was the way to get into the auto sector. Um, linear production is all about, uh, you know, is how they realize the economies of scale. And selling a high volume of cars is the only real way of making a profit. However, um, there are a ton of digital transformation going on in the automotive industry right now. Um, the whole servitization of the mobility experience, creating mobility as a service that a customer uses when they, they need it and they don't pay for when they don't. And the sharing economy, pre-pandemic, it was certainly looking very promising. Um, we, of course, have the idea of automated driving, vehicles driven by software, um, vehicles that are operated in a platform economy in a dynamic demand-based marketplace. Think about car sharing, perhaps, as an example of that. Obviously, software engineering is now the hot ticket into um, really any technology sector, but also in the uh, automotive industry. We're also starting to think about the uh, life cycle of the vehicle. How do we recapture value at its end of life? and uh, remanufacturing and uh, recycling the vehicles to retain that value. And ultimately, the, uh, the shift in terms of making a profit has gone from delivering mobility solutions to people who need them, but doing it in a way that makes a profit. So that's the kind of net view, if you will, on this digital transformation that's taking place. Um, let's think about what this means in terms of a value chain shift. So in the conventional automotive industry, as it has and continues to exist for you know, 100 plus years, you would think, OK, I need to get around. Um, you know, maybe I've moved to um, a slightly more rural city and I need to um, go to the shops and see my family and friends and stuff like that. So to that point, a car manufacturer, Volkswagen, Ford, whomever, are happy to sell you a car for, oh, I don't know, 30, 40,000 pounds. Um, it's probably the average new car price these days. <clears throat> And then that car is comprised of a number of components that are sold to the manufacturer by tier one suppliers at a probably, I don't know, two, three thousand dollar piece of business. Um, and then each of those components is made up of a number of subsystems, which might comprise somewhere between ten and a hundred dollar piece of business. So. Um, so you can think of it as a, you know, a funnel of revenue where you start with this very large piece of business that's the customer facing thing. And it kind of trickles down an order of magnitude each way, each one at each step. <clears throat> so this is the way that the automotive industry has operated, and the supply chain is very much driven by economies of scale, and has led to things like just-in-time production and um, the development of lean manufacturing um, to really squeeze out those profit margins. Um, now, if we think about mobility as a service and how autonomous vehicles may fit into that. Imagine a customer these days that has uh, perhaps lives in a dense city and thinks, right, I need to get from my house to Piccadilly Circus and I want to use this uh, mobility service to get there. So uh, let's imagine that this is an autonomous vehicle. They probably, the customer would probably pull out uh, their mobile phone and open their app and um, summon an autonomous vehicle to their house. Now that piece of business is, some, you know, they will interface with a service provider similar to Uber or Lyft, 
um, to hail that autonomous vehicle. That autonomous vehicle will have an automated driving system and also um, be the car itself. So these are the two kind of second tier pieces of value um, that are key to delivering that service. And then below that, you'll have a hardware supply. You may have um, software suppliers that uh, provide, say, uh, some of the subsystems in there, and then other suppliers that you know control systems, actuators, et cetera, et cetera. So already we're seeing that this is a little bit more fragmented in terms of where that value uh, comes from. And this piece of business is not, unfortunately, a $40,000 piece of business. This might be a $20 piece of business. So already the big question is, is how do we distribute that profit through this, um, through this value chain and think about how um, you know, this car manufacturer, say, for example, which is used to taking a large chunk of that revenue home themselves, um, how are they able to share in that, uh, um, in that uh, income with, say, the software developer who's also developed um, you know, a really rather expensive piece of value here as well? Now, um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, draw upon some of the business model theories from my MBA here. And I wanted to offer a case study of how autonomous mobility represents the convergence of a product service system. So those of you who are a bit more business oriented will probably recognize this, um, <coughs> this diagram. And I'm gonna give you a case study of what General Motors has been up to for the last 10 years. So General Motors, if you're not familiar, they're one of the big three American car makers. Um, they formerly owned Vauxhall over in the UK, they recently sold it, but um, <clears throat> they will um, have their core business model for the last 100 plus years has been to sell you a large vehicle, particularly here in the US, um, for I don't know, uh, how many thousands of dollars or a nice low uh, monthly payment. Now, in the 1990s, they launched their first um, digital service in the form of OnStar, their telematics um, connected vehicle service, um, which represents an integral uh, service to their products and again started to drive revenue through um, uh, not only monthly subscriptions but also some of the data they're able to collect on vehicles in life and uh, the um, ability to sell customers um, additional services through their vehicles through their infotainment systems so this is a kind of servitization of a product if you will in the conventional sense now, along comes this uh, mobility revolution with the arrival of things like Uber and Lyft that are very much results-oriented, uh, pure mobility as a service place. Now, I've chosen Lyft as an example here because very early on um, in the arrival of this uh, ride-sharing revolution, GM dumped half a billion dollars into Lyft. Um, they identified fairly early on that this is something that, that uh, will be revolutionizing their business model and therefore they decided to invest in it to understand more about how it would impact their business. On the back of that partnership, GM went on to launch their own car sharing service called Maven, which is similar to Zipcar. You can kind of book a car for a few hours or a few minutes even in cities around the US. And they actually even went as far as offering a version of that service to Lyft drivers so that they could uh, rent vehicles through their platform. So you can start to see across the house, they have some of these investments which are coming up this product service ecosystem here. Now, where it all converges, of course, is the development of their own autonomous mobility as a service company. I'm talking, of course, about Cruise. Um, now, they actually acquired Cruise for a cool, I believe, $2 billion back in, <clears throat> uh, I think it was 2017, and became um, very, Cruise became very rapidly uh, one of the largest autonomous mobility companies in operation in the United States. Crews run a fleet of several hundred autonomous vehicles in San Francisco. I promise you, I see them pretty much every day when I go out in the city here. Um, and you can see essentially what, what we have here is a building up of organizational competencies across these servitization, these digital services that they've launched and these productization of pure mobility services that has allowed them to build not only the knowledge, but also the data and the organizational competencies to um, execute on this uh, kind of convergence in, in and around auto <coughs> excuse me, autonomous vehicles. Now, I mentioned very briefly um, this shift in organizational competencies. So um, I want you to consider how different, how much of a departure it is for a car manufacturer who's conventional business model for 80, 90, 100 years has been stamping sheet metal and building transmissions and engines to delivering electric autonomous vehicles. Um, this requires investing in software development, 
in um, understanding how to make a vehicle operate safely on the road itself and how to work with regulators to approve and license that vehicle. Um, it also means if they are launching the services themselves as GMR with crews, how do they um, operate a fleet of vehicles? How do they manage those assets and generate revenue from them and understand how to maximize um, that amortization, if you will? And equally, how do they understand the mobility needs of their customers and become that interface point that's um, delivering them a targeted mobility solution um, that meets their needs and drives value for the customer? Now, these examples that I've given you are talking about autonomous mobility as a service. This is actually just one of many applications of automated driving technologies. As we've seen throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, actually most of the industry has pivoted to delivery and logistics. Um, the, the boom in e-commerce combined with um, the uh, demand for people staying at home and having things delivered to, to their front door has really exacerbated the pressure on supply chains. And this means pretty much all of the most successful autonomous vehicle companies, whether that's Waymo, Cruise, Neuro, um, they have all focused on delivery and logistics as our new applications of the technology. And fundamentally, it represents, I believe, a better business case. We can see proxies from Uber and Lyft that actually the ride sharing business is not very profitable and we haven't really hit on um, the cost reduction that's suitable to uh, encourage most customers to accept it. Um, and equally, they are heavily subsidizing all of their service operations at this stage. However, if you're talking about a truck which already has a bill of material cost in the excess of $200,000, <clears> adding $50,000 worth of sensors and software to that vehicle is not such a hard sell. Um, equally, um, there are a number of industrial um, off-highway and construction applications whether that's mining, construction vehicles in this case, even agricultural vehicles, um, which would benefit from uh, automation and the efficiencies of being able to operate around the clock. And naturally, as I'm sure you can all imagine, the defense sector is very interested in what you can do with autonomous vehicles, particularly when it means taking them into places where it would be dangerous to put, to put a service person, um, such as minefields or um, active theaters. <clears throat> so to quickly summarize, um, the industry has been um, developing rather nicely for you know, the last 10 years or so, but the sector is currently undergoing a very strong phase of consolidation. Um, acquisitions continue, um, but we're really kind of convening on maybe four or five key players who are gonna dominate the market. Um, and whilst uh, someone like Waymo will tell you that they have self-driving cars on the road today, um, we are still quite a long way from that being a ubiquitous um, and profitable service. That, that kind of profitability question does still remain. Um, building on that, the business model is still kind of crystallizing. Trucking and delivery, uh, particularly based on the conversations that we have here at the forum, truly is likely to become the first viable business model for autonomous driving. And hence, most autonomous vehicle developers today are working on platforms that can deliver both people and goods. And then finally, um, just to kind of put my policy hat back on for a second, um, the regulations and uh, uh, the whole governance of the automotive industry today is very much geared towards vehicles that you and I own. And you know there is this driver that, that is ultimately responsible for them. So when you take the driver out of the equation, some of these regulatory structures don't hold up anymore, whether that's how we approve a vehicle to, um, to be sold, or at least to be, to be put on the road, all the way down to how do we uh, license our drivers. With that in mind, the, the kind of pressing need is how safe is safe enough for the automotive industry across the board. So that's all I have for you today. Um, thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions, please do pop them in the q and I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes and answer. Um, otherwise, um, do feel free to shoot me an email or um, hit me up on LinkedIn. I'll be happy to chat further. Thank you, Tim. That was a wonderful. A lot of information, I think, for everybody in a, in a, in a very few, short time. So thank you very much. Um, there are a number of questions. Um, and I would like to start with a question from uh, Ineos Karen, uh, who has been for a long time active in, in KLM himself. Mm -hmm. And so um, he, asked, he asked us, what are the main challenges for traditional incumbents uh, for instance, car manufacturers or other OEMs uh, to make the leap from product to service and platform focus. 
And I would uh, add to that, if you see the, cu the current uh, uh, problems with Maven or for instance, mm -hmm. BMW and Daimler who has been um, shutting down share now, you see a lot of this kind of uh, um, service uh, based platforms that are not really working or at least they are mm -hmm. shut down. So um, I think this is a very relevant question. So I'll, how do you answer that? Yeah, um, I think the question and your your comments there really do hit at the pressing issue of developing organizational competencies. Um, it's very expensive and it takes a really long time to do to do all of those things, as you said. Share now, all of these car sharing experiments, most OEMs launched one at, at some point, and most of them have now shut their doors. So <clears throat> all of these mobility revolutions have been at a tremendous cost, um, and very few of them have been successful. So it really is, it has been a case of throwing a huge amount of money at, at the problem and seeing what sticks. Um, luckily, this this has generated a kind of secondary ecosystem of specialist providers um, who, you know, perhaps only focus on delivering connected services or, um, you know, these uh, these market -based, demand based platforms uh, and developing them kind of on a white label basis such that, um, you know, an individual provider can then license them and go deploy them. Um, and I think really um, it's the wrong strategy to try and do everything in house because it's it's just too expensive and it takes too long. Even GM, I, I mean, I chose it as a, as a case study because they have kind of all of the corners of that triangle covered, but right. they've been doing that for two decades and at the expense of billions and billions of dollars, and they still aren't necessarily winning. So um, even I would say, let the, the really hard pieces of the puzzle be tackled by Aurora and Waymo and Zooks, and then the OEMs need to kind of accept that they're just going to be providing a piece of that value chain in the form of a vehicle that somebody else's system is going to be offered onto and it's going to be deployed in somebody else's platform. Okay. Ijoma, you have all the questions from the uh, list. Yes, thank you, Professor Wim. Thank you, Tim. We have a question from Joa Silva. Thanking you for the information and wants to know what the main difficulties for autonomous vehicles and MAAS in third world countries? Um, firstly, the issue of infrastructure. Um, wherever the infrastructure is heavily degraded, um, the vehicle is going to struggle to operate. So it needs good quality lane lines, um, easy to read signage, um, traffic lights, etc. All of that, um, just to be good enough for, for the vehicle to read, it really needs to be excuse me, almost brand new. Um, so if the infrastructure is not there, then it's not going to be um, easy to get the vehicle to operate. Um, and then unfortunately, the, the kind of honest truth is there's the business case is very limited. Um, all of these companies have invested, you know, billions, if not trillions of dollars kind of collectively on this. And they're going to go to places where they can recoup that investment faster. And that means they're going to go to developed nations and highly densely populated cities where people have a lot of disposable income. Um, so unfortunately, the reality is in the, in the immediate future, it's going to be for, um, the haves, if you will, it's going to be for the wealthy countries. Um, that's not a status quo that I think is particularly helpful, to be honest. Um, and some of the uh, some of the work that some of my colleagues do is focused on um, deploying autonomous vehicles in mobility deserts um, and using it to augment public transportation rather than to just be a way for the wealthy to get about. So um, there are opportunities, but fundamentally it's a question of the market forces and, and the attractiveness of these private businesses. Okay, thank you for that. Um, another question from an anonymous um, participant. Um, what do you see as the main challenge for the to form the autonomous driving ecosystem? The ecosystem. Um, <clears throat> yes. Uh, it's it's a bit of a... Hmm. Uh, five years ago, it was the most attractive sector from a venture capital perspective. So if you had an autonomous driving startup, uh, you needed very little. Um, you needed to prove very little, at least, to attract a large amount of investment. Nowadays, um, the industry has kind of matured enough such that the excitement for technology has cooled off a lot. 
So um, sad, I would say, if you're an entrepreneur and you're thinking about launching a new LiDAR company or a, um, a mapping company or, or, you know, jumping into this space, you're probably five years too late. Um, and realistically, we're now in, we're in the trough of disillusionment in the hype cycle such that, um, you know, there's no longer large amounts of new money being thrown at this. And it's kind of accepted that um, the, the, the companies that have scaled up to this point are going to continue to uh, swallow up the smaller fish and, and kind of consolidate around um, larger, larger pieces of the stack, if you will. So, uh, yeah, that's a, a big challenge in terms of the ecosystem, I would say. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, another one from Peter Verhese. Do you foresee autonomous vehicles entering stage four, five in the medium future? What is the aim of companies like Tesla and other AOMs, or rather a wonderful dream for 20 years from now? Um, second question, a higher level of mobility require a fundamental different mindset and heavy investment in infrastructure, as you indicated, and, and as a recent McKinsey report indicated. As you briefly mentioned, um, as you briefly mentioned, it seems like China will be able to beat EU and USA in improving technology-driven mobility solutions. Is that also your perspective? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, there's a great couple of questions there. Um, so the level four, level five piece, we'll start with that. Um, so all of the autonomous vehicles that are being tested today, you could think of them as level four vehicles, whether that's Waymo over here in the US, whether that's some of the trials that are happening in London with Oxbotica in the Smart Mobility Living Lab, um, or uh, I don't know, Neolex in China, perhaps. Um, so an, a level four vehicle, if you remember, is a vehicle that is intended to operate without human intervention in a constrained environment. So if you say this vehicle can only operate on this in this business park or on this campus, and then that could be considered a level four vehicle. So all of those trials that are undergoing today, that are operating, take place today, I would say, are considered level four. Um, I think what's the, the tipping point for level four is when it becomes commercial services. So there are some commercial services in operation here in the US. Uh, Waymo will, you can hail a ride for a few bucks in the same way that you hail an Uber if you live in certain cities in Arizona. Um, and I know that, uh, to come back to the example of Neolix, they've, um, launched some uh, very neat uh, mobile uh, delivery and vending uh, machines in commercial applications in China. Um, now, level five is a bit of a myth, to be quite honest. So the true definition of a level five vehicle is a vehicle that can operate anywhere, anytime, any conditions without intervention at all. Um, the, real, the reality of this is there will probably never be such a thing as a level five autonomous vehicle. This means an autonomous vehicle that can drive in the snow or can that can operate just as safely on the streets of San Francisco as it can on the streets of uh, Hong Kong. And it's, it's very difficult to imagine a single vehicle being able to do all of those things. Now, different vehicles may be able to do those things very well. But to engineer one vehicle to do all of that, all manage all of those variabilities is not a challenge that I think is conceivably solvable today. Now, the question of Tesla always comes up. Um, uh, Tesla are a car manufacturer at the end of the day. So they're in the business of selling people cars with features and software loaded onto them. Um, Tesla Autopilot, no matter what anybody tells you, is a level two automated driving system. If any of you have a Tesla, please, for God's sake, it is not a self-driving car. Um, you are responsible for engaging the system and knowing when to engage it and for monitoring it in continuous use. Now, in my past life as a consultant, I used to spend a lot of time messing about with Teslas and sending them down the road with nobody in it. And I can tell you, do not do that on the public road, otherwise you're going to hurt someone. So that's my little piece on Tesla. I do not own any stock in Tesla. I've never had a financial position in them. Blah, 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 blah. Um, <laughs> anyway, I'll start rambling. Um, infrastructure, that was the last piece of that question. Um, some autonomous vehicle manufacturers are doing, are doing their development in, uh, in, a, in isolation, essentially. They're not doing it relying on any connected infrastructure. This has been Waymo's approach. Um, they are saying that, you know, we don't know if this infrastructure will be here anytime soon. So we're going to develop as if it's never going to exist. And um, there are some developers that are using connected infrastructure, whether that's smart traffic lights or uh, 
um, other um, uh, types of vehicles of infrastructure communication. Um, and it can make the systems a lot safer. Uh, I'll, I'll pause there. Thank you for that, Tim. Um, another question from Lydia Kostova. She wants to know what your, your opinion is on application of pilotless air tankers for wildfire fighting. Um, I am not an aviation expert, so I can't fully comment on that, but it does sound very interesting. <laughs> Okay, another question from Shilpa Ramachandran. Um, she wants to know how much of an environmental impact do you think autonomous vehicles can bring about for the amount of investment that is going into for its development? What is its contribution in terms of sustainability? Yes, okay, that's a really interesting question. And I think it's one that's actually not very well understood at the moment. So. Um, if you're thinking of doing a PhD on the subject, I thoroughly encourage you to do it because it's a really interesting sector. Um, there are some applications where it is easy to make a case for um, the increased efficiencies of autonomous vehicles. And a lot of the um, anticipated deployment, I'll say, is that um, autonomous vehicles will bring with them electrification. So it makes sense for, say, a robo taxi, which is driving around the city and might only cover, that, cover less than 100 miles in a single day, um, for that vehicle to be electrified. Because when it's out operating on the street, it's actually not going to need all that much range. It's just going to be moving around city traffic all day. And so taking a combustion engine out of the equation makes a ton of sense. Um, now, if we think about some of the applications that perhaps aren't electrified, like um, autonomous trucking, then there are still opportunities for um, automation to provide some of that decarbonisation. One of the early applications of autonomous driving technologies in trucking is something we call platooning. Um, so this imagines, uh, if you imagine um, there is one truck in a series of perhaps three, four or five, um, which has a human driver at the front of it. And then it is joined subsequently by um, two trucks that follow it at a very close distance and when the driver of each of those trucks is able to get within a couple of feet at the back of the truck, they engage a cooperative automated driving system that essentially mirrors all of the actions of the driver in the lead truck. So this is, think of it as an adaptive cruise control that is programmed to follow the first truck's movements very, very closely. And perhaps it can communicate with those, uh, with that lead truck and its, um, and understand all of its acceleration inputs and everything else. And by allowing those trucks to follow each other very closely, um, you're able to realize potentially massive fuel economy gains just by cutting down the drag on each of those trucks. And every truck you add to the uh, train actually adds to the efficiencies of the first truck. Um, this is because of the wake effects and the, um, the turbulence. This is, if those of you who have done CFD, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about now. It all kind of spirals. Um, but essentially, every truck, if you imagine by putting one truck behind it, that truck might realize a 20% fuel efficiency gain. The first truck might get a 10% fuel efficiency gain from that. If you had a third one, that becomes 11% for the first truck, et cetera. And fuel costs are a huge part of, of what makes logistics and shipping expensive. So that's another reason that um, uh, I don't know, I'm rambling again. I'll, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll stop there. Joma, can I steal the last question? Yes, please. Thank um, you. Because I want to focus a little bit on collaboration between, let's say, uh, different actors that never have been really have to be that, that that didn't have to work together in the, in the past but have to work together now because of avs uh, think for instance about that that one role you had in your table the responsibility who is responsible previously mm -hmm. it was obviously the driver but now it becomes the vehicle now mm -hmm. it's the vehicle is is responsible is it then the insurance company so who is involved there the insurance company policy makers probably uh vehicles so or manufacturers or, or their probably also associations of, or, or the associations of, of drivers. So um, how does that work? A second example is, for instance, uh, if you look at the infrastructure, so you mentioned it already connected infrastructure, but I can imagine in cities, if you really want to have autonomous vehicles uh, in, in a massive amount, you probably have to change your city structure too. So smart city structure can probably be adapted or have to be co-involved or have to be co-evolving with, let's say, the introduction of uh, auton autonomous vehicles. Uh, I can think, for instance, about parkings, about lanes that you have to, uh, to draw, so buildings that have to be um, uh, uh, designed in a different way. So uh, do you see any, any um, 
challenges there? Do you see also opportunities there? Um, maybe it's a broad question, but still, I, I want to force you in that direction and see if yeah, yeah. something interesting is there to pick up for us. Um, so, yes, yeah, so the first question responsibility. Um, it's a bit of a misnomer that autonomous vehicles will not require insurance. They will still require insurance. They will still go wrong, hopefully far less frequently than human driven vehicles. But as far as, you know, as far as uh, the insurance sector co is concerned, that their, their business model is still going to be alive and well. And they'll be insured in a slightly different way than um, individually driven vehicles. Um, most of them will be deployed in fleets. So there will be a fleet policy in place. They may end up being bonded rather than insured in, in a similar way to um, the way that police vehicles have to put up a bond in order to be put on the road. Um, but that's a, a, a kind of a slightly new, a nuanced um, sector of the insurance space. But the insurance industry actually isn't that worried about autonomous vehicles. They see it as a way of reducing the amount of claims they have to pay out, which ultimately can drive their profitability. Yeah. Um, and a question about the kind of urban transformation piece is very, very interesting as well. Um, as you say, uh, there may well be areas of cities that are geared directly towards autonomous vehicles, or at least that aim to eliminate human driven vehicles or reduce them. So you can imagine, say, perhaps an area like um, the, the initial congestion charge zone in London, a you know, small nucleus of a city where um, uh, at least privately driven vehicles um, are no longer allowed to go. And with that in mind, you can rethink your use of street space. Um, you can perhaps uh, increase the number of bike lanes. Um, you can reclaim some of that street space to become uh, green space or um, outdoor dining. And all the ways we've seen our, our cities change in the last 12 months is kind of a proxy for that. Um, and it is a great opportunity to make cities more pleasant for, for people to be in. Um, and of course, um, dedicating lanes and uh, the, the changing infrastructure does, of course, unlock a world of IoT and, and all of those smart cities devices that come along with it as well. And we have an entire team that does that kind of research as well here at the forum. So, um, yeah, that's... Uh, what, what is the city to look after? To, to because what, what is the city has, uh, who is it taking a lead in this? Um, I would say London, probably. Um, so they have their Smart Mobility Living Lab, which they are operating as a test bed on a series of streets that they um, used to encourage autonomous vehicle developers to come and test in London. But they've been doing that so that the city authorities can think about, okay, well, how does this change our relationship with our streets and how do we rethink um, the space and the infrastructure that we can control? So I think that's a great example of a publicly funded test bed um, that is going to kind of set the pace for the city's strategic decisions going forward. Very good. Thank you very much. We are going way over time, so I'm sorry about that. But uh, thank you again, Tim. This was a great presentation and even better and more interesting answers on the questions. Um, I, I just have to introduce, let's say, our next um, uh, speakers. And I would say two speakers, but one dropped out for the next time. Uh, so um, I have still Magoli face, and she's going to focus on the legal perspective of data sharing. Uh, so that's something we didn't focus on yet. Um, the second speaker, so that's a question mark. So let's uh, let's keep that secret for the uh, for the, the next email I'm going to send to you. Uh, June. So the, the next meeting is May 20, and I have already the full uh, agenda for June 10th. So that's the fifth uh, webinar. Uh, there, are, then I have Karen Cook from Kaiser Permanente and uh, Joop de Groot from CZ. Both are insurers in the medical sector. And we would like to hear how they um, perceive, let's say, all the challenges and opportunities related to the digitalization. Um, thank you for um, staying with us till the end. Um, we will share, of course, the uh, video, uh, but you need some time. We need some time to do that. So that will be end of next week, probably. Um, stay tuned. You will receive an email where you also can look at my LinkedIn page for information of, on the next uh, webinar of the May 20th. Uh, have a safe uh, evening. Um, uh, thank you for sharing. Thank you for being here. Thank you for uh, sharing your questions. And we see each other May 20th. Bye bye.